simple idea here is at least from today's session even how can you take away one skill which you can go back and apply uh, immediately so like ron mentioned uh, you know one of the things that i do very actively is executive coaching with senior leaders and cxos across multiple organizations so like i said this is one of the most in demand capabilities today for leaders and if we look at the definition of executive presence it's all about the persona that lets everyone around the person know that he or she is in charge is confident and capable of leading others and let me give you some examples very live examples as live as the last 5 6 months of some of the encounters that i have had with different stakeholders in some very large indian and multinational companies of what they are expecting from their leaders so as part of the coaching process i uh, interact a lot with the stakeholders to understand what they are expecting from the person being coached so the first person who was in the uh, being considered for a bigger role the the clear message from the stakeholder was she's extremely good technically but you know what she is uh, reluctant as of now to get out of her comfort zone and embrace what it is really needed to influence others across the organization she really knows her stuff she is technically very very capable but this is one thing if she does not do her career will get stagnated so one of the parts of the of the entire coaching process was how to develop her leadership presence gravitas ability to influence across different departments including her own and even across geographies so this was one very live uh, case which was there in in a large multinational where a career could have been stagnated if this was not dealt with the second one was even more eye opening this was an indian multinational and this was again a uh, uh, somebody very senior who had lost 50% of his team in the last one year in uh, north america as well as south america they have large presence in these markets and uh, when the exit interviews were looked at and i also spoke to a few of them the immediate feedback was when this gentleman is asking questions it sounds like an interrogation there is no room for any differing opinion if there is a differing opinion i am immediately shut down and then the conversation just stops again it's a case of is the person being seen as somebody who is trustworthy people would love to work with him or her and give their best every day again a case of developing that executive presence and allowing for different voices which we alluded to earlier in terms of signature voice the third one was very interesting again this was about a leader who was again very very capable working in the organization for many years but every time he had to make a presentation to senior stakeholders all his confidence would just dwindle away so things he knew things that he had done for many years when he was presenting those ideas when he was presenting those innovative thoughts somewhere he could not make that impression and year after year he was being you know overlooked for the big role so to a large degree executive presence is not just about delivering results consistently that's a given that that is taken for granted that you have to deliver results consistently it's about the signal that you send it's about the perception that you create that i am really ready for the bigger role i am really ready for the more challenging role and that's the signal that's the message that i am ready because you need to keep in mind that three things change rapidly when you move from one level to the next in any organization the first thing that changes is the skills that are really needed at one level are very different from what is needed at the next level so the skills change the second thing that changes is what the organization and the stakeholders expect from you in that in that role that expectation completely changes as you move to the next level and the third very important is where are you spending your time so if we do not develop this capability of 
gravitas, signature voice, personal branding, and those skills which will enable you to perform at the next level or demonstrate to the management that you are much more than just performance, the signals are clear. That's where the role of executive presence comes in. So let me move ahead. Where, where do we require to demonstrate executive presence? Where, where is it needed the most? If you look at uh, some of the examples in the current scenario that we have, one of the biggest ones today in terms of executive presence is uh, communication, clear communication, engagement of people because we are not meeting, we are uh, primarily working online. And so to a large degree, it's about communications, using different platforms, uh, being able to manage change. We are in a situation today, we, we have been hearing this four letters for a long time, VUCA. Everybody knows what VUCA is, but just for the others, some of you who may not have heard about it, it's volatile, ambiguous, complex, and uncertainty. That's the situation that we live in today. And if I may say so, we are on a, a kind of a VUCA on steroids right now. There is so much of change happening. So communicating that change, uh, making sure that the senior stakeholders are engaged, uh, that they, they are influenced, that's again where the presence becomes very, very important. And in terms of the, the teams below, it's all about connect, it's all about care, because there is so much of a work from home with managing the work at home, managing kids, managing elders, and of course, the, the work that has anyway got to go on. Uh, and also about influencing and building one's own capability to be relevant as the situations change in, the, in, the, in our workplace today. So skills which got us so far here and have been successful may not be enough for us to build it further. So it's all about taking stock where we are and making sure we are keeping ourselves relevant. So this is where leadership presence will play a big role. In fact, there was a very interesting study that was done by uh, Warren Bennis uh, a few years back when he flipped the question and he asked people, why, what, would, you know, what are you expecting from your leaders? What do you need from your leaders? And while there was a long list of things which came in, four things came as non-negotiable. The first thing people told us is we want to work with leaders who will provide us with the purpose, direction, and meaning. They will tell us why we are doing what we are doing. We are ready to work long hours. We are ready to really put in our best. But please tell us why we are doing what we are doing. That's the first expectation people had. The second expectation people had is we want to work with leaders we can trust. And today that is very, very critical in the times that we live in. And so we asked, so Warren Bennis and team actually asked people, how would you know that you can trust this leader? He said, it's very simple. The, is there a congruence between what the person is saying and what the person is doing? Is there, there has to be no gap between say do ratio. The third thing that people told us is, uh, told Warren Bennis and team is, they would like to work with leaders who are optimists, people who can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And today in, our, in the situation that we are in, that's extremely important, is how we are projecting what's possible rather than you know, uh, give a doomsday picture. And the fourth one is people said that we want to work with leaders who have a bias for action. Don't just give us Gyan sitting in, a, in an AC office with beautiful PowerPoints. When required, please you know, roll up your sleeves and show us how it is done. So when you flip the question, this is what people also expect. So there is a lot of merit in developing these capabilities as we develop ourselves as leaders. And that's why we are calling it the X factor of leadership. So moving forward, let's see, let's demystify the executive presence for greater influence, you know. So if you can uh, go to the chat box and if you can uh, reflect and, and put in your answers to the question, just think of someone in corporate life that you might have worked with, right? Or have seen or heard or read about that you think has very good impressive executive presence, right? Can you put some names on the chat box? 
so people are typing shashi taru ratan tata indra nui narendra modi ratan tata chan ma bill gates mark zuckerberg samit ghosh simon sinek steve jobs azim prem ji narayan murthy indra excellent excellent so as you think of these names and these are the ones that comes to us immediately santrup mishra yeah absolutely yeah and uh, uh, so let's look at what are the qualities that are there in people who who have this very impressive executive presence uh, we capture it in in a in a particular way i'll just share that with you so someone mentioned shashi tharoor so here he is uh, so this is uh, mr tharoor at oxford now whether you like his politics or whether you agree with his politics or not he is someone you can't ignore uh, this is from a talk uh, at a debate that happened at oxford and we will just watch uh, about 4 5 minutes of this video and then i will have a question for you guys so let's listen in ron is the sound clear madam president <clears throat> and gentlemen ladies of the house I standing here with 8 minutes uh, in my hand and uh, this venerable and rather magnificent institution I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII school of public speaking that as Henry VIII said to his wives I shall not keep you long <laughs> but now finding myself but now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you i rather feel like henry the eighth's last wife i more or less know what's expected of me but i'm not sure how to do it any differently <laughs> <laughs> perhaps what i should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today we had for example sir richard otway suggesting they challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of british colonialism while well, i stand to offer you the indian example sir richard india share of the world economy when britain arrived on its shores was 23% by the time the british left it was down to below 4% why simply because india had been governed for the benefit of britain in britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in india in fact britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of india the handloom weavers for example famed across the world whose products were exported around the world britain came right in they were actually these weavers making fine muslin lightest woven air it was said and britain came right in smashed their thumbs broke their looms imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products and started of course uh, taking the raw materials from india and shipping back manufactured cloth flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of victorian england that uh, meant that the weavers in india became beggars and india went from being a world famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer went from having 27% of world trade to to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh <laughs> while and the british had the gall to call him clive of india as if he belonged to the country when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him <laughs> by the end of the 19th century the fact is that india was already britain's biggest cash cow the world's biggest purchaser of british goods and exports and the source of highly paid employment for british civil servants we literally paid for our own oppression and as has been pointed out the wealthy victorian british families that made their money out of out of the slave economy one fifth of 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 the of the elites of of the wealthy class in britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting 3 million africans across the waters and in fact in 1833 when slavery was abolished what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid 
not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that your Wi-Fi password at this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from, the, from this compensation. Okay. So, uh, very compelling arguments from Sashi Tharoor on reparation. And so let's look at what constitutes these seven C's of executive presence. And then we will do a quick poll on how did Shashi do on, on these seven C's. So this is an easy way to remember how to uh, look at executive presence as a capability. So the first one is charisma. Now charisma has to be based on authenticity. Why? Because people are uh, some, somewhat, uh, you know, questions in their mind about charisma without authenticity. Somebody who kinds of wings it, gives it a spin, but not really authentic. So remember what we were talking about uh, earlier in terms of say-do ratio. There has to be a congruence between say-do ratio. So charisma, which is based on authenticity. Uh, confidence, very, very important has the ability to be direct in a non-confrontational way. And this is very, very important uh, in our kind of society where we sometimes becomes, they become a little uh, uh, subservient to senior leaders and we go for consensus rather than uh, mentioning things directly. Then credibility, they are the recognized as the go-to person in the organization people know that this is the capability, this is the, uh, this is the you know, uh, thing that they are known for, something that they have built their credibility on it for many years, because they are the go-to person. Connection, very, very importantly, the same message they are able to communicate to multiple audiences. And if you look at the names that you had referred earlier, which you had put in the chat box, this, the people are able to communicate their messages amazingly well to different audiences and create that connection. The fourth is clarity, clarity about when to say no. This is a very, very important skill. It's about being assertive. It's about saying no when required, not just for the sake of it, not just to be a devil's advocate, but when to say no. Uh, conciseness. Today, people have very short attention spans. So it's very, very important to be very succinct and clear because people very quickly tune off and they, their mind starts wandering and there are these gadgets we have in our hand which actually accentuate the problem. And the last one is composure, which is extremely important in today's time, has grace under pressure. So right now we are all under pressure because of the pandemic. Has the, is the person, does the person has the grace? Does the person has the ability to handle the stress under pressure? So these are the seven C's of executive presence. And in our, the four hour workshop that we will do, we will dive into each one of them and give you uh, techniques and clues into how to develop these as part of your leadership capabilities. So let's look at uh, the, uh, let's do a quick poll on this. This is about uh, you rating uh, Shashi Tharoor on these seven C's. The highest is uh, 60% uh, at uh... Eight, uh, the people have rated the highest. Okay. So there's a uh, nine. Yeah. Yeah. So for the question number one, Charishma, we have uh, 30 percent overrated eight. For confidence, we have uh, uh, 39 percent who have rated nine uh, uh, ten and 30 percent have rated nine. For credibility, uh, we have 50% uh, who have rated 44% who have rated 9 and 31% who have 25% uh, who have rated 8, 22% who have rated uh, 9 and 15% have rated 8. Correct. Connection again, we have 28% uh, who have rated 9, 25% have rated 10. On uh, clarity, we have... Uh, 33% who have rated 9, 31% who have rated 10, and 21% who have rated 8. On consensus, we have 30% who have rated 8, 29% uh, rated 9, 20% uh, who have rated 10. 
Okay. And on composure, we have uh, 31% 9, 27% 23% 8. Correct. Okay. So let's go ahead. Thank you for uh, polling. So let's move on. Uh, so one of the uh, interesting things to look at is how does it, all of this is good, but how does it really help improve impact and outcome? The first thing that happens is, uh, you know, when you have executive presence, when a leader has executive presence, people feel comfortable around them. They feel connected and over a period of time, they also feel very committed. The, the loyalty factor also increase. So that's another thing that happens. So let's look at uh, uh, somebody who uh, we all look up to in terms of uh, not just the, the, uh, the way with the contribution to the, the, the freedom struggle, but also looking at how he used uh, the, the, the economy of words to actually move masses and how he uh, did that. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, situation we have from the Gandhi movie. Let me play that for you. So as you watch this movie, look out for the gravitas which Gandhi brings to the table, uh, to, to, the, to the courtroom scene. Uh, look at his behavior and also look at his communication, the way he communicates to the judge. So this is about a scene where he is actually brought into the courtroom and the judge has to take action and how Gandhiji responds there. So let's look at this. You have been ordered out of the province on the grounds of disturbing the peace. No, no. With respect, I refuse to go. Do you want to go to jail? As you wish. All right. I will release you on bail of a hundred rupees until I reach a sentence. I refuse to pay a hundred rupees. <laughs> Then I will grant release on bail without payment until I reach a decision. So let's look at, uh, uh, if you look at the, the seven C's of, of uh, executive presence, you will find a lot of them reverberating here in, in from the, the court scene that we just saw. So uh, let's quickly do a poll uh, here again. Um, so if you look at the, uh, in terms of the charisma, 58%, so 58 people, 31% have given 10 out of 10. Confidence, again, 51%, 10 out of 10. You can actually see that resolve in his voice and in his body language. Credibility, obviously he enjoys that credibility with people. <clears throat> Connection. Connection. Yeah, sorry. You're saying something wrong? No, no, carry on. Clarity. Very, very clear of what he wants, the end result. He's very concise. He does not use uh, too many words. He's to the point. And of course, in terms of composure, you can see he's completely in charge. So let's move on. So if we look at this, uh, uh, these seven C's that we talked about, they primarily come into three buckets. One is the character, the substance, and the style. So in character, we have credibility and confidence. In substance, we talk about conciseness and how do we create the connections. And in style, it's all about clarity, composure, and charisma. And all of these play out when we are talking about the gravitas. This is a word I've been using quite for quite some time now. So it's the seriousness and the importance of manner causing feelings of trust and respect in others. So this is about somebody who really owns the room, so to speak. When people walk into the room, others take notice. They clearly own the room. When they speak, others listen. 
So that's what gravitas is all about. So the character, substance, and style help us develop that gravitas. So, so now for our, for our workshop that we will do, we will do a lot of exercises in terms of how do we develop these three elements, attributes of gravitas in terms of the character, in terms of substance, what we are saying and sharing, and the way in which we are sharing it, the style. So let's look at somebody who's completely from a different, uh, uh, you know, from, from Gandhiji's time to now. This is Manish Sabarwal. He's the chairman of uh, Team Lee. He's also on the board of directors of RBI. Now, as you watch this video, very interestingly, watch for character, watch for the substance of what he's saying and the style, the manner in which he is sharing. And then we will uh, take a look at this, uh, evaluating this as well. Right now, there's so much of uncertainty with jobs, you know, the layoffs happening. And, 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 and if you meet young people, they are a little scared of the overall uncertainty, what will happen to their dreams, to their prospects. If you had to tell them that, you know, these are some of the things that they should keep in their mind, what would that be? At this well, point, I think that's, that this is the next 25 years in India will be completely different from the last 25 years. This is our time. We have made, we, we should have made more down payments. But since the reforms began in 1991, we began to dismantle a regulatory regime, which was um, hostile to entrepreneurship. And um, I think that all of us who do startups recognize the odds of startups. Many, very few startups um, grow and even fewer startups succeed. But that doesn't mean, I mean, you want to guarantee, go buy a toaster, right? I mean, the only guarantees in life come with the appliances. They don't come with careers. They don't come with jobs. They don't come with anything else. So my view of the world, which I think most entrepreneurs tend to share, is that entrepreneurship is the art of staying alive long enough to get lucky. You know, we good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I think that all of, all of, all, you, we will, employment has shifted from being a lifetime contract as my parents spent their entire lives in one career and one job. It's shifted to being a taxi cab relationship. It's short, it's sweet, it must be intense. But the most important criteria you should use should be learning, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's the wrong filter to think about should I join a multinational or an Indian company? Should I join a big company or a small company? Should I join a manufacturing company or a service company? The only filter which you should use for evaluating a company is, is it a growth company? Yeah. And because that's where you really learn. So, you know, one company or the other, you should look at it as a portfolio of skills. And only other I would add after this crisis, which I, which I think many of us knew for a long time and were a little baffled by some of the entrepreneurship going on in the last few years, was that resilience is important. You know, mm -hmm. being consistently warm is better than hot or cold. You know, Ludo is a better game to play than snakes and ladders, right? Because Ludo mm -hmm. is more laborious. You know where you're going, you'll eventually get there. Most people don't realize the snakes are longer than the ladders and they're more snakes than ladders, right? So, so consistently warm rather than hot or cold is not lack of ambition. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, customers pay salaries, not shareholders. Yeah. And so I, I would... For, start, for people who are looking to work with startups, I think in addition to their growth potential and their addressable market and everything else, you must evaluate their resilience. Because in the next 25 years, the compounding that has begun in India around our domestic consumption is just beginning. So I would, you know, this is, this is a passing shower for India. It's not climate change. It's climate change for the West. I think that aging economies, you know, the sale of adult diapers cross baby diapers in Japan. Um, and it's, you know, their population will come down from 125 million to 75 million in the next 25 years. And for India, this is when our per capita. Okay. So as you can see, a lot of substance, a lot of style, a uh, lot of what we call as chutzpa in terms of, uh, you know, conveying the message through very interesting uh, examples. Now, what is intriguing is, we know this is a very important skill that we need to develop, a capability that has to be developed. But while, why many of us uh, face, face these challenges of developing these traits, knowing fully well that our careers could get stagnated, we may not get noticed, perceptions are getting formed. So here are some examples as to why this happens. The first one is 
self limiting beliefs we somewhere have a belief in us that you know these uh, this is something that i can't do this is not for me which is i can't go out there and and you know uh, speak my mind or or confront somebody senior or influence somebody senior or appear in some other department so there are self limiting beliefs that we put on ourselves the second one is somewhere we believe that these are all traits we are born with but what i want to share with you as a practitioner of this for many years is these are all learnable skills these are all skills that can be learned and and practiced third is there is a belief that this is who we are and we are kind of you know doomed to be like this throughout and nothing can change well it can if you want to put in your deliberate practice and awareness uh sometimes people try too hard to impress you know in the process they come across trying to impress but not expressing clearly so it's very very important to understand it's more important to express than to impress the fifth one is all of these skills require us to be vulnerable for some time which means stepping into areas which we haven't done so far which means raising our hand and, and you know sharing that thought in the meeting room or differing with a senior leader or uh, standing up for something i haven't done before so it's all about trying to be uh, being vulnerable and trying out new things and there could be others as well so what are the clear uh, you know reasons where you know executive presence can get completely killed the first one of course is arrogance if if a leader has arrogance if a if a if a if if this seen as somebody who's too full of himself very very self centered doesn't think about anybody else everything is about me myself then that's a big killer in terms of executive presence and the last one is ego giant ego uh, not willing to learn not willing to listen and that's where you know it again creates a huge amount of problem and it's a killer in terms of executive presence so we call it arrogance self centered and ego So let's bring in an expert. This is Chris Westhall. Listen to him speak about executive presence. Very, very, very important. I want to talk with you about something that you recognize when you see it, and you sense it when you don't. I'm talking about executive presence. My name is Chris Westhall, and in this video, I want to share with you four ideas that can help you to create greater executive presence, increase your gravitas, and the impact that you share with the people around you. This video is being presented as part of my work with TCU, where I'll be teaching a two-day course on executive presence. If you'd like to know more about this course, the details will be down below. and you can check it out. But first of all, where does executive presence come from? I want to share with you some principles that can help you to create the kind of influence and persuasion that you need because that's what comes from executive presence. Now, it may look like executive presence comes from your title or your experience. But if that's true, let me just ask you, did Mark Zuckerberg have the experience of running a multi-billion dollar company like Facebook before he did it? Actually, no. And yet Yet he certainly did and does have the executive presence to do his job. So that executive presence did not come from his experience, and that's true for Michael Dell. That's true for the leaders who you admire, the folks who are in executive roles. That experience that causes them to have executive presence isn't something in their past. It's an experience that they have in the moment. And what that means is, is that executive presence is never more. than one thought away. And that's the second principle that I want you to realize. First one is that executive presence does not necessarily come from your experience. The second is that executive presence is never more than one thought away. The key is when that thought shows up to engage with it and to ignore the other thoughts that are keeping you from being the executive and the leader that you need to be. Where you put your attention is where you will find your results. And when you focus on impact and service which is the source of leadership you find a new kind of communication a new kind of connection if you will not only to yourself which is called self leadership but to the people who you care about and looking in the direction of outcomes and impact is the key to executive presence because executive presence means that you can prove these four 
words, these four words with certainty to the people who you wish to influence. And here they are. I've thought this through. And if you want to add a couple more words to that, I've thought this through for you. Because leaders, executives, look in the direction of outcomes and impact for the people that they care about. Why? Because leadership is service. And when it comes to creating executive presence, and here's the, the fourth principle that I want to share with you, that presence starts with your story. The way that you communicate and connect with your employees, your team, your investors, whoever it is that you wish to influence is the source of your success or your failure, as the case may be. It all starts with the way that you communicate and understanding leadership language is central to establishing the executive presence that you need. Leadership language focuses on connection, service, and authenticity. Leaders understand that the four words that I shared with you before, I've thought this through, points towards consideration, looking in the direction of outcomes and impact. And so if you want to create greater executive presence, remember, executive presence is never more than one thought away. Executive presence isn't about experience, not your past experience. It's about the experience that you create for the people around you an experience of authenticity, an experience of service, an experience that says, I've thought this through and I'm looking in the same direction you are and considering the outcomes that matter to you. The leader's job is to make those outcomes matter. And that task starts with your story. Understanding leadership language is the key and the, the fourth principle to bringing your ideas to life because when you look in the direction Okay, so this is one aspect. The other one, very, very important, is the signature voice. It's all about finding your voice, your signature voice, your presence. So what it basically means is uh, looking at from the perspective of yourself, from the other person, voice for the others, ability to connect with different stakeholders, voice for self, which means you are able to authentically demonstrate your value. And the intersection point is your signature voice. So in the workshop that we will do, we will look at different uh, exercises as to how to develop your own signature voice by uh, making sure that you have taken into uh, consideration the voice of others, but also developing your own authentic demonstrating voice. So that's very, very significant aspect of this entire program. The other one is how do we develop sharp storytelling skills, analytical storytelling skills? There is a term here today, very, very common called death by PowerPoint. And how do we tell stories in a concise manner is what gets the influence and the audience. So this is what we will also look at as one of the critical skills in our workshop. The third one is in the area of personal branding. Very, very important that we develop ourselves as what we are known for. So what's the brand that we are known for? What is who are we the go to persons for? What is, what is it that we bring to the table? And what are the benefits here is in terms of interviews, job placements, promotions, speaking engagements. In fact, one of the most important questions that one gets asked in any interview is, tell me something about yourself. And over the years, I have heard some very, very boring answers to that because people have not thought through their personal brand. What do they really stand for? If you are not excited about your own self, how can, you be ex how can the other person feel excited about what you stand for? So a strong personal brand can help you do this. And we will, in our workshop, we will touch upon these capabilities as well. And the last one, which is very, very critical today, which none of us can do without, is all about online presence. So online presence using the different tools which are out there, uh, it's about... Uh, you know, going for uh, bigger opportunities, uh, senior level opportunities, and all the others that are there. So we will look at the three pillars of online branding. How do we build it? Uh, whether we, Whichever tools that we are looking at, LinkedIn or the others, uh, how do you optimize it? And very, very importantly, how do you monitor it so that you can make sure that it is being used effectively and truthfully? So... Uh, these are some of the skills that we will look at in our workshop. Please remember that powerful executive presence is extremely important for you to cut across the clutter 
there are so many uh, you know uh, perceptions that get formed and sometimes man management or senior leaders are only looking at data which confirms their perception so it's very very important to look at executive presence from these four standpoints the gravitas the signature voice the personal branding and finally your online presence so with this i uh, come to the end of uh, my talk uh, ron uh, next steps please yes yeah. in case you have questions you can type it in the chat box and we can ask uh, uh, we can ask um, uh, the of bhaskar so that he can share those uh, questions if not uh, there is one uh, last uh, i have for you if you can just uh, give an answer is there any more questions do let me know yeah, yeah sure in case you have any questions you can also type it on the chat box uh, sanjay is asking are all c's equally important no no not really it will all depend on uh, the context and of course uh, the levels that we are trying to influence how do you define connection so connection is all about uh, uh, you know being able to communicate messages uh, across multiple levels of people and still have the connection that you can build so the same message for example we are giving right now we are we are in tough times or whatever the way you are communicating that message across different levels of the organization how you are creating connects with your people uh that's very very important yeah uh, somebody is saying that we missed the c of courage <laughs> yeah absolutely i think uh, that that's an important one uh, and somebody is asking a a question on how important is it to build voice skills so the signature voice that we touched upon is is very very important in that respect the voice skills and that's where also the element of courage comes in where we are demonstrating our authentic self without getting uh, you know subservient so sanjay i had already answered the question that the tool is under development i'll be sharing that later on yeah sanjay yeah sanjay can you explain conciseness is what uh, 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 is asking so conciseness is being is being succinct uh people don't have patience for long sentences or you know taking too long to get to the point the attention spans are very small today so it's very very important to be concise and to the point and you you should have thought thought it through in terms of communicating what is the clear message that you want how do you want the message to land and what action you want that other person to take so that's where conciseness comes in being succinct so thank you everybody for uh, being here and uh, thank you for taking time to give give your feedback yeah, yeah absolutely if you focus on yourself and use this whatever and work on it it will help you become better and if you are really keen on building it you can join us for the workshop and uh, bhaskar will be conducted in the same workshop in detail So thank you everyone for your time today really appreciate it